So I want to have a conversation with you tonight. For me to sit up here and go, wah, 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 neo-modernist, wah, 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 wah. Okay, so I don't like to lecture about art, and I'll tell you why. Art is an interactive experience. There's a person or a group, because some artwork is done by collaborative um, groups of people, who quest through the visual arts um, to put something out in the world that has form. It's also true about the musical arts, the theater arts, you know, any of the performing arts, um, that there's an object of contemplation that is held out to us in a museum, in an art gallery, um, in a church that's been converted into a performance space, you know, a, in a concert hall. And they put this object of contemplation there, and we have to come to it. We have to come to it as individuals, Sometimes we come to it as a duo or a community of people so that we can have a discussion and have our world come alive in a completely open-ended, non-discursive way where we can reflect upon the fact that we're enjoying a work of art. So I want to have a conversation with you tonight. For me to sit up here and go, wah, 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 neo-modernist, wah, 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 or as child, wah, 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 wah is just not a fun way to look at art. Um, it also doesn't work with how people make meaning between their short and their long-term memory. If we talk about an artwork tonight, you will be able to reproduce that experience with another person, not coming to the same conclusions, but you'll have a way in together, where if I sit here and tell you everything there is to know about the antecedent work of art, and I put it into an architecture that relates to art history, you'll think, oh, that was so edifying, and you will leave the room, and I guarantee you that 40 minutes later after a cup of coffee, I brought you back in here and told you to talk about the work, you would remember nothing. <laughs> so, tonight I'm gonna to ask a very simple question to start the discussion. What's happening here? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> you see nothing happening there. What, what's happening on that canvas? Well, light. What, light? Life. Life is happening on the canvas. I think maybe we should start moving the microphones around. So. Okay, I, I apologize for saying okay. nothing because I'm looking at a landscape here I don't see anything moving in it. I see life because I see grains. I see possibly a stream running through a field. Um, I see possibly hills in the distance. I could be completely wrong. <laughs> and then I see the artist had an inspiration to uh, uh, create something abstract on the bank of uh, what might be a body of water. Great. So who wants to add to the idea that there might be something abstract on the bank of this water? The first uh, impression I have is, um, I'm afraid not a compliment, but it's that this is a painting. I can see uh, some paint and some different kinds of paint, but you have to be there seeing the real thing in order to actually know. And so I'm wondering, is that light over there on the right-hand side, is that part of the painting, or is that a reflection in the photograph? Oh. But you're not seeing something on that screen that isn't in the canvas right okay. now. Okay, well, that's what I wonder, okay. because then that's a doorway into somewhere. I mean, it's got more light than anything else. And then this amorphous blob that has moved onto the shore there is pretty scary compared to the water and the cliff and the background. So that I, I find a lot of tension and kind of um, mystery in this. Great, right in front of you. I could see where this is a, 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 saying something about climate change and pollution. I see a field and I see stuff 
coming like a waterfall cascading, and that amorphous shape might be some pollutant coming into the water. Great. Go ahead, and then I'm just trying to. I'm just wondering. Can I just play the mic a little closer? I'm just wondering if it's a work in progress. It doesn't seem. Uh, no, it's finished. It's, it's been finished. exhibited widely. Well, then I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so why do you say I have no idea? So go deeper with that thought. What's unresolved to you? To me, the, uh, there's a lot of, of unresolved because there's this shape in the foreground that's very crisp. Mm -hmm. And then what other people are referring to as water, which I could definitely see as water. Um, there, it appears that, that this is a field, um, you know, going into, However, the, uh, the method in which the paint is applied to the canvas is, is, is very different in each of these things, so I don't, I'm not getting a, a whole thought. Okay, so let me first tell you, you are very far away. The, the, what everybody is reading is field is actually a cliff. When you're up close to it, it is a cliff, um, and it's got three or four layers of paint that define the cliff. The, the title of the painting is Mendocino. And Mendocino, you come off a cliff and you're at the water. Um, so um, I, I think part of it is the scale that it's been projected and how far away from you is that it feels a little unresolved. Um, but I can assure you it's not. <laughs> um, but there, there is this like, bleh, right in the middle of, of what's otherwise a beautiful canvas, and there is this portal. And that's where the interpretive possibilities start to reside. And I thought somebody up here had a hand? Okay, right here, and then we'll come, we've got one here and one here then. So yeah, I sort of noticed the cliff that you were talking about, so I noticed the water, and then that blob abstract kind of green in the middle with that some sort of a monolith was like, for me, something unexpected that didn't belong there, so it made me wonder, because the rest was something that it felt like it was an ecosystem that it was, you know, uh, working together, but then those two elements was, they were for me something that didn't belong there and made me wonder. So I'm looking from above and wondering what's going on that doesn't belong in here somehow. But it's there. Okay, so somehow this mysterious, almost carved portal with a light coming out and this blob are other than the landscape itself. Okay, so we had someone here, and then why don't you bring this mic down here so she can be next. Okay, so, sir? Uh, my, my first uh, perception of what I see is a, is a beautiful photograph of, of the reflection of the water first of all, and the landscape, as superimposed on that is the actual map where this has originated. And it seems uh, as though it's an island which is very long, and this is a small portion of it in a photograph. That's interesting. That, yeah, that's interesting that you're seeing the large picture and then the inset of some other place. Okay, now down here? Up at, top, at the top, is that an airfield? Um, it's a cliff that has some sort of um, shrub. Okay, in the front, is it remnants of a crash? No. No, what it, what it looks like is that there is this palisade, really. Um, so that there is some reference to um, greenery, vegetation, forest-like shrubbery at the top. There is a palisade, I mean a very steep-faced cliff, and there's water and a, and a closer shore, which for everyone I know who's lived in Mendocino sees that it's Mendocino right away. The part that is ambiguous and leads us to dig into the painting is what is this portal and what is this kind of sour yellow blob? Um, and 
for all the people I've talked about, I've done this, I had this painting at the Brattleboro, everything you're seeing here I've had at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center, and I've talked with somewhere between eight and 24 people in front of the painting. I've also used them at other adventures in looking um, situations with up to 50 people, although not sort of as deep and far away from it. <laughs> Um, and really this blob, for the most part, I think what has been said is there's something that creates a disequilibrium in all of us about having a portal we don't understand and a blob floating in space. So then what it is is coming to the conclusion of what, does, what is that blob? Is it an emotional blob? Is it a, a reference to climate change or environmental degradation? Um, is it some sort of spirit passing either out of this world into the next portal or something coming from the portal into our world? Okay, so coming back from my opening statement of nothing, <laughs> um, I guess uh, part of me wants to say that now that we've established the portal, although I like door because I feel like I see a doorknob there. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the, ye the sort of gold yellow uh, blob seems to be pouring out of the part of the portal that's light. So mm -hmm. I would think that light is pouring out. But of course, light pours out in a straight line. Light goes straight. Mm -hmm. This is not straight. So is something light swimming into the portal that I I don't think the painting answers that for me. Um, also, I wonder when the painting was painted. Uh, this is about a 98 painting. A 98, okay. Yeah. So that, obviously, we've had oil spills since then. I was thinking of the Gulf, but, you know, if it was sometime around that point. But um, it's, you know, light and something that's possibly pouring out from the bottom of the portal that's heavier than light. Okay. Oh, um, I see what you mean. Yep. Uh, so, of course, you know, what's heavier than light and black, I was thinking oil. That's what I'm, so. Is there a mark making in that blob? I see mark. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Plus, it's, it's over, the, the cliffs are highly worked. There's, um, a sort of rose matter and umber under, and then there's the same yellow, but it's been scraped away. He, he's used ways of scraping. He, so he's let runnels happen, then he's blotted the runnels, then he's let more runnels happening. So there's, there's quite a bit of dimension on that part of the canvas. Um, and the green blob, you can see through it, actually. Um, less so at this end. Um, it tends to be a little bit sheerer up by the portal, just because of what color it's on top of, but it's a fairly sheer blob. Uh, for the artist, who happens to be a friend of mine, um, he's been, he said, everything everybody's saying is true. It's all there, absolutely, and then not out of my head, absolutely, too. Um, the yellow blob, um, was actually an emotional response to the painting being too beautiful, and he threw it on there. <laughs> He's like, it's too pretty. And was the doorway part? It was already in there. The doorway was already in there. So it was definitely a pastoral scene from life, and then somehow a portal came into it, and he thought that was pretty interesting, but it was still too pretty, and he just, in a very... Um, surrealist way, just let the blob happen and then let it alone. So I see it as like a play on surface and to remind us that painting is about paint. Thank you. And there are all these levels to the landscape, but yet I'm going to be funny about it too. And I wondered if it was a mistake at first, and then he just kind of went with it. I, you know, he put that blob on quite deliberately. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a little dramatic for mistake, but yeah, right. um, but um, I see it as kind of a a comic sort of um, take on painting. Great, yeah. <laughs> but you're, I, I think the point that you're making that's so important is 
no matter what the um, narrative content of a painting may be for someone, a painting is all still really about painting and digging into the paint. And unfortunately, you'll all have to come to one of my talks at the Brattleboro Museum in front of a painting so that you can really experience that up close and not like from such a distance and projected so far away um, so that you can really see viscosity and see translucence and um, you know, all the things that makes painting so, so physically compelling to look at. I mean, sometimes content is emotionally and, and intellectually fun to look at, but ultimately there's an incredible visceral response to the materials of art. His name is Joseph Diggs. He's from Cape Cod, um, an artist from the Afro-Caribbean, African-American community on Cape Cod. His family's been there decades, actually a century longer than my family had been there. But um, his mentor in high school and my mentor in high school were the same people. And I didn't realize he had become a professional painter until somebody from the Provincetown workshop when he found out that I was from Cape Cod, from Osterville, this little village, said to me, that you do know Joseph Diggs' work. And I'm like, Jojo? <laughs> His sister was my high, high school biology lab partner, and he was a classmate of my brother's. And they were on the football team together. They were safeties. Which, they weren't the big men on campus, believe me. And I knew that he was one of Mr. Bolton's students, but I didn't realize that he had gone on to get a degree in art, and then as a 40-something year old, get his MFA um, and start painting really seriously. And it was a whole group of, of Provincetown um, Painters Workshop friends who put me back in touch with him. Um, so what do we think is happening here? Oh, come on, folks. Very, very far away, very up in the sky. Okay, way far away. Now, what if I told you that this painting is this tall by this wide? Oh, wow. Uh, so those people are really itty bitty 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 they bitty. They look bitty, like bitty. bugs. <laughs> right, right. And they kind of look like bugs there, except when you're in the room and only four feet away from them, they, the rendering is meticulous. It's very closed brushwork. Um, Uh, highly refined surfaces, very meticulously painted. But what do you think might be a little bit strange about this particular work? I like the rectangle, the direction that it's going. So there's a nice thrust into yeah. the scene. Yeah. What else? What else do you think is happening? I think the rectangle takes you out to the top of the picture and it takes your eye right across the picture on a diagonal out to are those boats or houseboats or something. They're cars in a parking those are cars. lot. <laughs> Okay. Okay, there are cars in a parking lot, which starts telling you something about the story here. So if there are cars in a parking lot, and this swath of white around the outside of this pool suggests concrete, where are we? It's strange lighting. Those shadows of the trees are so dense, and uh, the lighting throughout is very strange. It doesn't look real. It doesn't look real. No. Okay. So I think that the viewer is uh, placed in a building because I see something on the left side of the uh, painting that looks like a building, like the corner of a balcony or something. So these people, they are being watched, watched from a building. Just because of the distance, it seems like this is a sort of a communal space, but perhaps because of the perspective, it feels kind of alien and sort of, like, sort of disconnected. It's, um, like there's a gathering here, but because of the, perhaps because of the of the way it's set up, or because of the perspective that it's um, it's actually the folks there are sort of disconnected. Um, I don't. Okay. I don't know. I, I also Hi. I get Hopper out of it. I don't know why. Okay, we've got someone here, and then we'll pass to that gentleman there. Yeah. Hi. I um, I was struck right away by the light and that it must be late in the day, maybe, late summer. There's a, it's 
setting between two mountains. There's something going off, on off the, the frame to the upper right mm -hmm. that's creating the light that, 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 that you know, it's, getting, it's giving it a, a very strong mood. Um, yeah. Okay, anyone want to build off that or do we want to add something to it? Okay. Yeah, so um, maybe it's right off of, right building on that is that it feels like a movie set. Um, feels like there's a few HMIs up on the hill to the right, up the hill. <laughs> um, and maybe the guy in the uh, lifeguard chair is acting as a lifeguard or maybe he's directing the people in the pool. Brilliant. If I could see the details on the cars, maybe we'd see that one of them's a production van. I don't know. <laughs> but um, otherwise, if not, it's part of a scene that's like night and day. Okay, anyone else? It's a little hard to tell from this far away, but um, there's something a little strange the more I look at it. The uh, benches and the people on the benches around the pool seem to be very disconnected from the people in the pool. They look like they are wearing clothes and they're just kind of doing something that you wouldn't normally s expect people sitting around a pool to be doing, like they're in their own little world that's totally different from the people swimming. Okay. Well, the more I look at it, the more I feel as if there um, is no depth to the water at all. As if it's, it's more like ice than it is the water of a pool. Up there in the far corner, there's no sense that you can see into the water at all and see a corner of a pool. And so the only idea that it's actually a pool where people are swimming is the movement of the what look like bugs, but I see they're people. It's the people, but yeah. the water so doesn't that, move in so relationship. That, that kind okay. of thing is the only thing that tells you it's actually water. Could be jello, it could be ice. It could be. <laughs> okay, we've got someone way over here. I don't think what's in the pool are people. I think they're dolphins or some animals or they, fish. If you're up close, they are bodies. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, who else? Uh, the title of this one is just called Floating. Floating. The, the scale of the shed is, is way out of scale with the pool itself, making the pool look absolutely gigantic, which it is not. And, and the people are very small. Um, the shed seems really out of place. Okay, so she had read it as a house. You're reading it as a pool shed, the, the changing rooms, the cabanas, or whatever that is. Okay, Doreen. The sense of um, alienation and contrivance uh, seems so much heightened, almost like in a Richard Mizrak photo, by the way the body of water is tilted the difference between the shallowness, the perceived shallowness at the right side, and the almost over, towards overflowing on the left, and the coloration, transients. Okay, you actually got it. <laughs> Contrivance, a scene set, shallowness, proportion, like the, the lighting is like weird, like what's going on. Amy Bennett, makes models of swimming pools, of houses, of little rooms, little vignettes, and she puts little teeny models like this. She controls the lighting. She doesn't want to leave anything to, I'm up there painting from chance, and yeah, I want this little thing to be happening in a community swimming pool. She is investigating on one level what suburban life is all about and the little hidden dramas in when you see her painting, some of her paintings are only this big. Her biggest painting is this one. It's only this big, meticulously painted. They are completely contrived. They're completely theatrical. The kinds of angles and lighting come completely from set design or movie design. So you actually got it completely. <laughs>
And the best way I always find to actually dig into a painting and find out what's happening here is to do it with at least one other person, if not a whole group of people, because we get further together than anyone does get on their own. And it's fun. It gives us something to think about, and then you can go back and another level, I'm, like I'm rushing through this tonight because we have 15 minutes together. Um, although I figured we could go a whole hour because you're talking. I don't have to like blah, blah, blah for 40 minutes and then let you ask me questions for 20. Um, <laughs> that's my secret in life. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is we could come to this with a different group of people another day because you're either in New York and you're at her gallery or you're at the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center with two friends and you stumble upon this show and have another wonderful 15 or 20 minutes giving a great dialogue and having fun doing it and the richness of open-ended experience of artwork is the magic of what is the aesthetic experience. Our heads, our hearts, our, our souls are all working and we're reflecting on the fact that we're having a really good time with it and we really, if we're constantly going back to the painting, not to our grandmother had a pool back on Cape Cod in 1956, and blah, 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 and you're over here somewhere, not with the painting. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, successive viewings allow you to go deeper into the painting, and of course, the, if you know something about art history, if you know something about theater design or movie, gaffering, um, you're going a little bit further. If you know something about art history, if you know how paint is handled or perspective, you can go a little bit further. But in fact, just because you have a set of eyes and you're willing to slow down enough to talk about something, even if it's only to yourself, which I do all the time, uh, you can get in there and start to unpack the wonderfulness of what the aesthetic moment is. So now we're going to go on to another slide. Mm, okay. And we're going on to, we just sent these out to libraries we're friends with, Emily Mason. And Emily Mason just passed away on December 10th. Oh, no. In her 80s. And she was a national treasure, and certainly a Vermont treasure. Um, and these are three paintings um, that I've selected from the first survey of her work that I did and then went on tour. Um, this is a painting from 1956. And now it's a big leap of faith to actually look at something that's completely not tied to landscape, not tied to a narrative content like the first two pieces we looked at, and go whole hog into abstraction. So, what do we think is happening in this piece? She loves yellow. She loves yellow. <laughs> okay. Do you want to point to how many yellows are in the piece? Or? Well, it's, it's many layered. There's many layers going on. It looks like she started with other things going on underneath, but then yellow took over. And um, yeah, there, she's created all kinds of yellows out of the kind of lemon yellow that she was using, or I mean, that's how this slide is projecting it. You see the greens, you see the browns, but that lemon yellow is, uh, yeah, you can taste it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Use all your senses when you're looking at art. I've you say 1956, and uh, I'm having trouble remembering when, um, I believe the color field movement began in like the 50s, right? Yep. So, um, 1956 uh, was right in the midst of it. And I think uh, on some level I like to look at these and just un let my eyes unfocus and not even try to see something in them because I'd like it to be about the color and just to see how the blue balances with the yellow and the yellow balances with maybe the green. Um, and then of course, there's a rational side of me that starts to want to pull a figure out of it. Okay. Um, but I resist that. You resist that. I'll pass that on to somebody else. Okay, so who wants to pull a figure out of it? Just, it who's interested in pulling a figure out of it? Go right ahead. 
That's exactly what I did. I, um, I, up until the moment when you said it's not a landscape, I was convinced there was a sweet little girl in a purple raincoat with galoshes <laughs> and maybe a little red umbrella coming out of the fog and there's a big puddle in front of her. Oh good, other people thought so too. Okay. <laughs> but you are seeing a figure. I instantly saw the small child's figure okay. and it almost looked like an adult figure in the far distance that the child was seeing probably walking away. Okay, so you're seeing something above the, the, the yes. strong figure, there's a lighter right. figure above it. Yep. Did you have any, so everybody's reacting to this as a child. What makes you say child or a child and an adult? Okay. Okay, does someone want to add to that or? Well, I don't see a figure. I, I, I like abstract art and I like to try not to see a figure. And I like to think of the artist moving the paint around and moving the colors around and I like to see. And I wonder what colors did, he or, did she put on first and then what? And then how did she get back to the other ones? Okay, so you, you, you want to get into the color and the making of the piece. Okay, anyone? Got, got here and then we'll go down here. To, to, to me, this, this painting is much more interesting because it, it lets your mind wander much more than the previous ones which are trying to be very specific. And it, it, if you want it to be a figure, fine. Whether it's yellow or green or blue or something is the choice of the painter. But it's it's uh, I, I, this is much more interesting than what you've shown today, to me, because it is so abstract, and it's saying many things, which you which you can conjure up in your own mind. Okay, so what's it conjuring up for you? I didn't hear you. What's it conjuring up for you? Like we all can just say like sinking into this gorgeous series of pools of color. Well, this, this is, this is a, uh, a very uh, uh, complicated landscape to me. It has trees, uh, it could be trees and grass and very similar to the first painting you showed with the, which was a photograph to begin with. It looked like a photograph with its reflections, but that was that had to be very specific and very intricate. This, this is much more abstract and you can let, you, as I say, you can let your mind wander as, as to what this is saying to you. The more I look at it, the more I feel as if she was playing mostly with color. And so the, what I see as a purple circular thing is in contrast to the the yellow, the, they're complements to begin with, and then there's this lavender down at the bottom that settles it down, and then the brown is just in the background leading you around the canvas, leading you up and around, but you come back to this hugeness of the yellow, so it's really all about color. Okay. I should love that, go, ahead. go right ahead. Okay, I, I see it as very light, uh, very mystical, airy, floating. Those are some of the words that I would associate with it. Um, gives me a, a very light feeling. Great. Okay, now we have the young woman up in the back corner. I need to talk about color because obviously this painting is not about figure. And I keep hearing that everyone says yellow. I see a greenish yellow or a yellowish green. You know, it's not purely yellow or purely green. And, and that's what I keep looking at. It's a, that very bold color that is not really yellow. It has something else. So I, I don't want to talk about, about more than color in this particular one. I see several figures. On the upper right, I see like a grandmother's face. Her hair is white going towards the corner of the painting. Okay, yeah. 
Okay. And then you see her eyes and her lips, and she has like an arm holding like a book. Okay. In front of. I wish I had one of those. Little a red figure ones. that I, I can't can really tell saying. what it's, it is, it's but it's behind the book. Yep. And between what we think is the child and the book, I mean, maybe it's my eyesight, but I see like a Christ-like figure between the child and what I think is the book, and I'm feeling like the angelic person is like the grandmother and whoever's behind the book is singing. Okay. Now we're gonna come down to Doreen. I think I that there's such a, a lovely, elegant, curvilinear line of progression from the way we hold the concept of figurative and abstract that starts at the bottom left and progresses up into the upper right. Okay. And it makes me overall technically, as a painting, think about the way we configure concepts of abstract and figurative, representational. I think I have it backwards, but there's that wonderful quote by the California painter Elmer Bischoff, who was figurative, then abstract, and figurative, who said something like that kind of switch hitting, that he left, going back to abstract from the figurative was like leaving a church and going into a gymnasium. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I love that. Yes. I guess um, at first I, I was looking at it through color, and then the thing is when someone, when someone mentioned the, the possibility of that figure, the blue figure in front as a child, then it's kind of hard to unsee it once you've seen it that way. Um, and, but, so I'm sort of trying to turn it back around and look at it sort of, and I'm having a difficulty sort of seeing it just as color or, or as just mm -hmm. as, that, you know, once you start looking at it representationally, it starts, it, it's hard to unsee it. Um, I'll say it's, it, it, that's, that's all I got. Okay, it's kind of like looking at a box that's made out of just lines and then you push it forward this way and backwards this way. I used to do those boxes for hours in classes that I was bored in. Positive, negative, negative, positive, abstract, figurative, figurative, abstract. <laughs> um, what happens if I tell you the title of this painting is Phoenix Rising? Does that change it for anyone? Um, I just want to show you the other two Emily Masons, and I'm going to read you something in conclusion. Why don't we go to the next slide? Uh, you're not seeing how alive this one is. You know, it just it shimmers that gold color. It's not metallic gold. Um, over the, the darker rust colors against the cobalt blue, she's working complementary colors one off of the other in this one. Um, and it is, um, it's striking. And then the last slide, and she's working color harmonies here. So for any of you who have studied painting, you know, or, or Maybe you're my fourth grade art teacher who would put a color wheel out there and say, these are the primaries, these are the secondaries, this is what analogous color means, this is what complementary color means. She's working off of all of those ideas as well as, so, so first and foremost, Emily is known as a colorist. Then beyond that, it's the, the, the numerous ways that she gets color to work with each other from you know, just a of paint and then letting it run to blending it into these color harmonies, to letting it dry, to putting an over color. So for instance, the icier white, green, blue on top really is this just one big gesture that goes across the painting where other parts of the painting have been blotted away and then brought back up on another level. So I, I was told we only have an hour, which gives us about six minutes. But I'm going to read you what I wrote, because this is, I spent 30 years at Brattleboro writing about art. Um, and I, my audience is the adult lifelong learner. It's not another art historian. 
It's not a critic. It's not even other artists. It's most of you, although some of you may be artists and some of you may be art historians. And Emily Mason, may her memory be a blessing, really brought me of age as a looker. And so I want to impart something she taught me. One fall evening, some close to 30 years ago now, 25 years ago, I walked out the front door of the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center with Emily Mason, just as the sun was disappearing in the sky across the plaza behind the old one-story Brattleboro co-op building. She stood still and gazed with a rapt expression on her upturned face and remarked with wonder in her voice, oh, the lavender. I stared at the sky, streaked with gold, pink, and blue throughout, and I thought, what is she seeing? Glancing at the buildings on Main Street, I saw golden lights striking the bricks and deep maroon shadows, but no lavender. Nor was there any in the recesses of the yellow-toned Latches Hotel and Theater. As my eyes darted around the scene, the voice in my head kept asking, where's the lavender? Where's the lavender? Then slowly, it bloomed in subtly in the tinted air between the sky and our faces, lavender. Mason's eyes taught me to see something they were unable to see, and her paintings do the same. And then I go on and talk more about the paintings, which is, you can read the book because it's in your Manchester library. <laughs> and so what I say about um, Emily at the end of the essay is, to another place, which was the name of the show, traces the artistic arc of a career. What you will encounter is a remarkable consistency of vision supported by an increasingly nuanced mastery of paint and form. Emily Mason's most recent paintings are dynamic visual symphonies, evoking rather than describing. They move us physically, emotionally, and spiritually with their interplay of colors, their coalescing of forms, and their shifting intensities, densities, and fusions. Contemplating Mason's work is much like watching a storm or a sunset or a sunrise. So in conclusion, I said, I invite you to be taken to another place by Emily Mason's paintings. And the next time you step outside, I hope you encounter the lavender hanging in the air. So you can go to the Manchester Library and you can take what we did together tonight. And I hope you all see the lavender in the air and spend a lot of time at one fabulous library. I am so impressed. I have not been over here since you built it. It used to be my first 30 years in Brattleboro when I would travel around the state with the Vermont Arts Council or many other things that I did in the state. Everyone would say, oh, you're from Brattleboro. We're so jealous of your library. We're so jealous of your library. I'm so jealous of your library. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.